This is a sermon from St. Paul's Church, Brookfield, Connecticut, transforming lives through Jesus. For more information, go to www.stpaulsbrookfield.com. We're in our second week of a summer long series on the life of King David. And today's message is about spiritual battle. And before we pray, I'd like you to consider something. May we be grace-filled toward others, for everyone you meet is fighting some kind of battle. Let that sink into you through the Spirit. Be grace-filled toward others, for everyone you meet is fighting some kind of battle. Let us pray. Lord, as your servant St. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, declaring that his heart was wide open, may our hearts be wide open to you and to one another. As we contemplate what it means to be people in a battle, and show us how we can live as the true victors that we are, as we follow the truest victor of all time, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Life is a battle. We can't get around it. Back in 1982, after 211 days in space, two Soviet cosmonauts finally came back. And they had real physical troubles. Their hearts were palpitating, their, their blood pressure was going up and down, their pulse rates were off, and they were very dizzy. They couldn't walk for a week, and after 30 days of therapy, they were just barely learning how to move again. The lack of gravity had deeply affected them. And so the Soviets came up with a special suit called the penguin suit. Maybe you remember that from back then. It was a running suit with all kinds of elastic bands on it. So each time the cosmonaut would move in his recovery, he would be against resistance all the time, which would further his recovery. And those penguin suits are used today in children's hospitals for children suffering from neurological problems and other disorders. They're actually called the Adeli suit, A-D-E-L-I, and it's used to help them through resistance. Have you noticed that life is full of resistance and it never quite seems to dissipate? Do you sometimes long for that resistance to just go away? Do you ever dream of that time when there will be no more opposition and resistance ahead of you? I think we all do at some point in time. We often long for days without difficulty, but do you know what? God knows better. God knows how we are to live. The easier our life, the weaker our spiritual fiber. For strength of any kind grows only by exertion. Life is a spiritual battle and there's just no getting around that. We're going to look at that this morning. As we face opposition God's way, our faith is strengthened and Christ's likeness can shine through. That old adage, no pain, no gain, really is true in a spiritual life. You see, there are still giants in the land, and God is looking for some Davids, even today. And God finds them in those in whom Jesus, the son of David, lives. And to provide the conclusion of this message up front, to quote the most important verse from our passage from 1 Samuel, for the battle is the Lord's. This is not your battle. This is not my battle. The resistance we face in life, the spiritual opposition, it is a battle indeed, but it's God's battle, not ours. How we participate is God uses us to fight the forces of darkness and resistance all around us. Willing or unwilling, we'll have to face them. Let's look at our passage for today. There is a lot of rich biblical history surrounding it, and I'd like to start with that. David and Goliath, that story is well known. It's on many Sunday school walls in different forms. To step back and to see the context, we come back to King Saul. We looked at Saul last week. King Saul, months before this battle between David and Goliath, had routed the Philistines. He had pushed them up to the coastal side along the Mediterranean before this great valley that David and Goliath would battle in. And so the Philistines were angry and humiliated. Months before, at a battle called Mishmach, I think that's how it's pronounced, Saul and his son Jonathan to come up with a special plan to destroy the Philistine army. Jonathan had figured out that there was a secret passage that he could go around to attack them from another side, and indeed he did. 
And what's really interesting, this is sort of an aside, during World War I, a British major was facing off with the Ottoman Turks in that exact same location and consulted the Bible and read to his Brigadier General the story about this secret road or passage. And you know what? They used it and they routed the Ottoman Turks just as Jonathan had done the Philistines all these years later. This is sacred land with a rich history. And so that's what had happened. And so they were teeming with anger. They were outraged. And so there they were at the top of the valley. And on the other side of the valley, near the highlands where the Israelites lived, which the Philistines wanted to destroy, was the Israelite army. So you got Goliath on one side of his army and Saul and his army. Now where's David? Well, David's doing what he does. He's taking care of the sheep. And he's basically a grocery boy. He's going and getting food and bring it to his brothers on the battle lines. Now, David had been anointed, remember, last week we looked at this, as the king. Yet, as we also noted, it would take 12 years before David would actually ascend the throne. And this is what's happening in that middle time. So David comes with the groceries, he puts them down, he sees what's going on, and he's deeply offended because he's seen this big thug named Goliath blaspheming the name of the Lord his God. And who was Goliath? Well, we believe he was about nine feet tall, if the biblical account is in any way accurate. His armor weighed over 125 pounds. And he was part of an ancient race that was known well to the Israelites, and they were indeed afraid. Now, if you men are part of my Joshua Bible study, this will be familiar to you. We looked at this bit of history as we continue to explore the life of Joshua together. And it's important to note the background on Goliath and his people. He was from a town called Gad, G-A-D. It was one of the regions that Joshua left some of these ancient giants in when the rest of them were driven out. Let me read the account to you. Now the spies that Moses sent out after Moses was leading the children of Israel to the wilderness for 40 years, at one point, spies were sent out into the Promised Land to scope it out, to see what they were up against before they invaded it and the conquest of Canaan. This is what the spies came back with after 40 days. And I would note, by the way, that Goliath's taunts went on for 40 days. At the end of 40 days, they returned from spying out of the lands. And they came to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the Israelites in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the lands. And they told him, we came to the land to which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Yet the people who live in the land are strong. And the towns are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. Anak. Who are the Anakites? They were like ancient giants. Goliath had come from them many years later. The Amalekites live in the land of the Negev. But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. Then the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against this people, for they are stronger than we. So they brought to the Israelites an unfavorable report of the land that they had spied out, saying, The land that we have gone through as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people that we saw in it are of great size. There we saw the Nephilim, that is, the Anakites come from the Nephilim. And to ourselves we seemed like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. You ever felt like a grasshopper in the face of great opposition? <laughs> Thinking to yourself, there is just no way I can overcome this. Well, that's how the spies felt. Yet Joshua and his men pressed on and drove those giants far out, except that they left them in a few areas. One of them was Gad, the place where Goliath had come from. Now, who were the Nephilim? Well, that's another sermon for another time. But one thing I'll say about it is this. If you read the biblical, biblical account, it suggested that fallen angels had procreated with human beings and created these otherworldly type humans who were opposing the Israelite forces. That was their interpretation back then. However, these giants came into the world. They were huge. And the Israelites were naturally afraid, just as the spies had been over the course of 40 days. So Saul and his army were terrified over the course of 40 days. As Goliath came and taunted them day and night. Well, David will have none of this. And so you've heard the story this morning. David goes out to fight. He first puts on Saul's armor, but then realizes he's actually going to get him killed. He doesn't need that armor. 
He has the Lord his God with him. There's another connection here, a foreshadowing, if you will. Last week we looked at how David foreshadowed Jesus in his baptism. That is Jesus' baptism. Of course, foreshadowed by David's anointing for the Spirit. By David going into the valley after 40 days and taking on this force of darkness and the person of Goliath. He was foreshadowing our Lord Jesus Christ, you could say, who went into the wilderness and was fasting and was tempted for 40 days and fought back with the Word of God, which we know as the true armor of God. And that's what David had with him, the armor of God. The whole Christian life is one battle after another. And most of us will face a whole army of giants before the story is fully told. What are the giants in your life? What makes you feel like a grasshopper? What can't you see to overcome in your own strength? What is intimidating you? And where is God in that? There are two takeaway points from this lesson this morning I'd like to share. One is, may we look at reality from God's view. Sometimes in life, especially when we're going through opposition, we can be very close to something, and it's a bit disputed. <clears throat> we're too close to it, you could say. We can't take in the full perspective of what is really going on in our life. Just as time heals all, it's been said, with enough time and enough distance, we can actually see things for what they are. And that's how God sees reality, because God is not just in reality with us. God is, in a sense, beyond our reality, the true reality. That's what it means to follow Jesus, who is Emmanuel, God with us. God is with us in suffering. God did not come to take it away, necessarily. God came to be with us in our trials. You know, David didn't see Goliath from his standpoint. He saw Goliath from God's standpoint. David did not look up at Goliath. He looked down on him with the vision of God. And so how can you look down on your problems rather than up at them? Think about that. May God give you the vision. May that resistance, like the penguin suit, cause you to actually step back and up and to see them, these problems, for really what they are. Opportunities to see the power of God at work in your life. One of the most frightening things to see under a microscope is a butterfly. One of the most beautiful things to see from a distance is a butterfly. You might be too close to what you're going through. God and the Spirit allow you to step back and see things from God's view. So that's the point number one. Look at reality from God's view. And number two, wear only God's armor. There are many things in life that we employ to fortify ourselves. Money, health, various kinds of security as we define them. Those things aren't bad in and of themselves, but what do we really fight evil with? What really allows us to be overcomers from a spiritual standpoint is God's armor. And we can't discuss God's armor without reading Ephesians 6. May this be your armor. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, and fasten the belt of truth around your waist, and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times, in every prayer and supplication. That's the armor of God. That's how we fortify ourselves for the fight, for the battle which we all must face. Because indeed, we are all in battle. You see the news. You see what's going on in this world. There's a battle. It's not flesh and blood, meaning it's not just a human-oriented and generated fight. There's a spiritual battle underway. Which side are we on? By the grace of God and with the help of Jesus, 
we fight in God's armor. So a professor in Holland took time to calculate the cost of an enemy soldier's death at different epochs in history. He estimated that during the reign of Julius Caesar, to kill an enemy soldier costs less than the equivalent of what we know today as one dollar. At the time of Napoleon, it had considerably inflated to more than $2,000. At the end of the First World War, it multiplied several times to reach the figure of some $17,000. During the Second World War, it was about $40,000. In Vietnam, $200,000. According to the CNN security blog, as of February 28, 2012, to kill one Taliban soldier in Afghanistan cost the U.S. between $850,000 and $1.4 million. Human war is increasingly tragic and costly. But what about our spiritual war? Well, the price was fully paid by Jesus at the cross of Calvary. It costs us nothing because it costs him everything. And it isn't tragic. It's full of hope. Our weapon is God's love. It is inexhaustible, and it wins eternally. What did Jesus say? No one takes it. That is my life from me but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I receive from my Father. By rising from the dead, Jesus has defeated eternal death and made us victors over every force of battle we face because nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ. If you're going through a health scare, if you're experiencing economic collapse, if you're lost, Jesus is with you. He'll fortify you for this battle. Because we all must fight this battle. We can't avoid it. In Jesus, we have everything we need. So in conclusion, let me ask you again, what giants are you facing? Are you looking up at them from below or down on them from above with God's view? What armor are you wearing? The things of this world are God's eternal protection in Jesus Christ. Be grace filled toward others. For everyone you need is fighting some kind of battle. You are not alone in your battle, my friends. As the body of Christ, we fight with and for one another together with the greatest weapon in our arsenal, which is God's love in Jesus. And remember, ultimately, the battle is not ours. The battle is the Lord's. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.